Welcome to our KEI Network webinar today, Improving Project Management, a Canadian Opportunity. Are you and your organization taking project management seriously? Can you tolerate the consequences of failure, whether you are in business or an industry leader, the public sector, or in the kitchen? As a baker such as I am, we're all engaged in some time or another in project management and celebrate or suffer the consequences for success or failure. Uh, Yogi uh, Schultz today will be uh, leading the webinar uh, and the distinguished panel of Klaus Rodenberg, Dragan, and Marjanovic plus Mel Head will be uh, uh, his able assistant. So without any further ado, Yogi, I want to turn this really, really interesting series because we've got a follow-up webinar as well. Over to you, Yogi. So you're on. My name is Yogi Schultz. Welcome to Improving Project Management, a Canadian Opportunity. Thank you, Perry, for the kind introduction. The many large problematic projects we hear about in the media cause some to wonder what the underlying issues might be that produce these unhappy outcomes. One of those issues is the quality of project management. We'll discuss how improving project management can lead to more project success. We shouldn't conclude that incompetent or inadequate project management is the exclusive cause of the problem and projects we hear about in the media. So before we start, I want to introduce everyone here who's on the panel today. So I'm Yogi Schultz. I'm an information technology consultant. I consult in a variety of projects that occur within the oil and gas industry. I'm heavily involved in strategy, data analytics, and system uh, implementation. Our daughter and I recently wrote this book, A Project Sponsor's Warp Speed Guide to Improving Project Sponsor, Project's Performance. If you're interested, you're welcome to just Google my name on Amazon and this book will come up. I don't sell anything else, that makes it easy. So I'm gonna turn the time over to Klaus to introduce himself. Hi, I'm uh, Klaus Rodenberg. I've got uh, more than 40 years of experience in uh, the design and uh, construction industry, mostly on the design side, starting as a drafter, designer, project manager, and ultimately a uh, sustainable design coordinator. I've got a, a Bachelor of Arts degree from the U of A on industrial design, as well as a master's degree from the U of A on uh, communications and technologies, where the focus uh, for me, it was basically on uh, communities of practice and knowledge management. Thank you, Klaus. Moving on to Dragon. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dragon Marjanovic. I own uh, several businesses in the tech uh, in the tech sphere, uh, uh, and part of our uh, part of my business is running several, or part of what I do is run several businesses and. I've encountered project management and uh, and the struggles that we kind of all are going to talk about in, in several different ways. And um, a few years ago, we started looking at project management in a different light and came up with some solutions I'm happy to introduce today. Great. Thank you, Dragon. Uh, Mel? Hi, um, my name is Mel Head. Um, I'm a retired chemical engineer and I've never built a bridge or a high rise or anything like that, but I managed several projects that help people get their jobs done. Uh, the projects were usually in-house and they involve real-time process control software implementation and integration to data acquisition systems. The uh, project deliverable, <laughs> excuse me, deliverables also included uh, upgrades to systems and new applications that we developed to control aluminum smelting and petrochemical refining processes at plants across Canada. Um, with few exceptions, I was located out of province to where the projects were located, so that compounded the project management a little bit. I realized quickly that attention to communications and scheduling was important and a necessary part of managing diverse projects and diverse project teams and external consulting groups as well. The project teams typically consisted of people in my central development group, external consultants, and others at the project site who would ultimately be the users of what we were delivering. So having to manage what I could not see every day to ensure an outcome that would meet or exceed the expectations of the sponsors and the end users required strong trust amongst the project team. 
So I focused on communications and attention to the schedule, and that helped me get the job done. Thank you, Mel. Well, as I think you can see, we have assembled a team of quite diverse and considerable experience with the problems and opportunities of project management. I look forward to sharing our collective views with you. So here's the outline of the topics that we want to touch on today. Just some introductory remarks and then for a moment, what is project management all about? And then we'll focus in on the value of superior project management, the consequences of when it's done very poorly. We'll talk about the impediments that get in the way of superior project management. And we'll talk about the benefits of project management tools and how they contribute. And then we'll talk about conclude with some actions to improve project management. So we want to leave you with some ideas on how to strengthen project management in your organization. Uh, we invite you to interrupt and jump in with examples from your experience with these topics. The webinar isn't just about you listening to us talk. Uh, some of the ideas you're going to hear today are taken from our book that I mentioned a minute ago. Okay, so it seems like the problem projects are endemic. It doesn't really matter which part of the economy we're talking about. Infrastructure and IT projects are big ticket items for all level go of government. And the issues include unrealistic estimates, delays that add cost, inflation, supply chain issues, unrecognized risks that turn into a nasty reality. And the same issues affect private sector projects. Often the difference is there are fewer headlines about private sector projects because they have much lower societal impact. Uh, are the causes related to project management or many other factors? Too often, there's a disconnect between ambitious scope and insufficient or even modest budgets. I think you're familiar with some of these uh, projects. It was probably the ArriveCan uh, furor that uh, created the desire to hold this uh, uh, webinar today. And the Sturgeon Refinery has been uh, plaguing uh, multiple governments and it doesn't seem to be coming to an end. So what about some project outcomes? This table here on the left um, has been published for many years with very similar percentages. Uh, and they reflect a slow and steady improvement over many years. However, they also indicate opportunities to improve project management performance as well as project performance. The, the percentage of failed projects are often listed on surveys like this. That creates a misleading impression that project failure is mostly the consequence of poor project management. I only wish the world were that simple if that's all we had to fix. Many projects fail even with brilliant project management. The number one reason for project failure is unrealistic or even fantasy expectations. Hey, Yogi, if I can just interject on this one, uh, from comments on several books on project management that I've seen, um, a lot of executive leaders or sponsors uh, stated that one of their, from their point of view, the most common factor behind project failure and I think they talk about 37% of the time is a lack of clear goals and understanding. Uh, thank you for bringing that up, Mel. It, to me, I believe that statistics, but at the same time, I'm astonished by that statistic because that's really not that hard to fix. Um, and I think it's caused by the fact that some, or the bigger the project gets, the more it tries to uh, satisfy the needs or de demands or desires of a long list of stakeholders. And the longer the list becomes, the less likely you're gonna have a successful project. So just quickly, what is project management? It's the application of methods, skills, knowledge, experience, tools, and techniques to achieve a specific project goal and supporting objectives. So Mel already talked about the problems with the word uh, specific. Uh, it, th this sounds so simple when it's written like this, but it isn't. Many events or situations can derail projects. Superior project management can mitigate many of the adverse impacts of events and complete the project. So a project 
It's a limited time endeavor where the result is a new process, product, or service. Notice the focus on limited time. I'm sure everybody wishes that were true most of the time. So when we're discussing project management, we, just, we need to remind ourselves of this definition. And in particular, this definition distinguishes projects from routine observations. The last definition I wanna deal with is program, a group of related projects managed in a coordinated way to obtain benefits and control not available by managing them individually. Now, large undertakings are always programs, whether the people who are involved realize it or not, and they should be planned as a group of related projects. A superior plan for the entire program will limit the number of project interdependencies as much as possible. Uh, notwithstanding these highfalutin definitions, quite frequently project management is simply about nagging people repeatedly to complete their assigned work. People seem to work better if they're reminded about what they're supposed to be doing. So let's talk briefly about the uh, value of superior project management. Uh, it improves the probability of a successful project. It brings leadership and direction. That helps. Improving team morale and productivity. The structure and discipline that project management provide improves team well-being and performance. It's not unusual for the productivity between the worst acceptable programmer and the best programmer to be an order of magnitude. So this morale business is important. We wanna control risks, issues, and changes to the scope. If you don't manage the scope, the project will spin out of control. You, you can cut project costs with good project management because you can recognize what the work that's being done that's not necessary, or you can understand when there's a problem before it gets out of hand. Strengthening organizational buy-in. More and more we hear about people change management. It's no longer good enough to have a good product. You actually got to get people to use it. And we want to build team skills and experience. So the antithesis of superior project management is called the self-managed team. It's sometimes appealing to senior management because project managers cost money. Sometimes managers think, oh, I can hire another developer or an in engineer instead of a project manager. The self-managed team is a no nonsensical and dysfunctional concept that always ends in disaster. And Mel's gonna talk about a case no, study and communication sometime, is this it? I, I think that uh, what you've got on the screen here represents a good part of the core of project management. I guess as an analogy, uh, when we have a race car driver pulls into a pit for a tire change, he depends on his pit crew to do their job quickly and effectively. He, it helps ensure the driver has what he needs to win the race. And this driver must also have the trust and confidence of the whole team. They all know what they must do together and get the job done and do it in record time. And uh, realtors will tell you as a mantra for a quick sale that location, location, location is important. I guess just as I'll suggest from my experience that communications, communications, communications is a mantra for a project management, uh, a project manager. So um, history uh, may repeat itself. So I guess I'm old enough here to say back in the day when electronic face to face communication or even incessant emails that we all get today were not available. Effective communications was really supreme and still is today. Today, we have tools that the astute project manager can use to keep all of the team, the sponsors, and the recipients of the project aware. Good communications will build a common understanding of objectives, priorities, issues, prog uh, progress amongst the uh, stakeholders. Uh, it can surface the risks and misunderstandings before they become real problems. It engages the team, keeping them all on the same page and helps coordinate the work. It demonstrates transparency, breeding trust and with the sponsor and the clients. It allows for early course correction if the project risks going off the track. It allows the team to learn from each other and share experiences. Scheduling too is important. It's one of the project management, I guess it's one part of project management that we often feel is defined at the onset of the project 
and from all expectations will remain unchanged throughout the project. Well, we all know that's not the case. Uh, good communications can provide those early warning signs that can help us identify these issues and really give us the time to mitigate them. So issues and misunderstandings will be encountered and that's almost a given. So we can ask, you know, what can the project manager do about these concerns? Well, they can adapt their communication style to ensure that all parties to the project understand the issues and do so in a regular manner. Um, the project manager can also actively solicit feedback from the project team and the clients so questions and concerns can be addressed effectively and quickly. Sharing those insights into critical issues can help us look ahead for unseen potential issues, upcoming decision points, and critical concerns before they're overlooked, underestimated, or really become problems themselves. Communications need not be only horizontal across the project team, but up and down the organization hierarchy to ensure overall project ownership. So I guess as a final word, I'd really like to say that effective communications in project management does require effort, but it pays, pays huge dividends in keeping the projects on track and the stakeholders invested and engaged. Okay, thank you, Mel, for that warp speed discussion of the value and the opportunity of superior communication. So what are the direct consequences of poor project management? Well, there's this long list that many of you have probably seen and heard before. And cost and schedule issues are the most common, but some of these other ones affect projects as well, particularly uh, this, this world. I'm thinking of the line called quality issues, which is uh, dogged uh, Boeing this week in the press. Uh, so that uh, door panel insert really was the tip, you know, blowing out was the tip of a bigger quality uh, I problem iceberg. So there are also indirect consequences of project, uh, poor project management. You know, they're more subtle, like reputation, loss of market, missed opportunities, sustainability risk is a fancy way of saying you might actually become bankrupt if you don't uh, do this particularly well. So let's talk about the impediments to superior project management. And class, this was uh, your contribution to our day here today. So take it away. Uh, yeah, thank you, Yogi. Uh... When Yogi asked me to, to be part of this, and I thought I'd take the easy one and do the critique one where you can be critical of things and not have to worry about things. But one of the things that I'd noticed is that uh, Yogi's uh, background in project management is mostly on the IT side, large IT type projects, coding, that sort of thing, of which I have absolutely no uh, knowledge at all. Mine is more on the... Um, uh, design side uh, for uh, construction infrastructure type of, of projects, which, but what I found was that the things that he had listed as things that make a uh, project go off the rails were very similar to what I had experienced uh, in that, uh, in that area. And so I just came up with kind of a, this is by no means a uh, exhaustive list, but just some of the things that seem to uh, have a problem on most of the uh, uh, project uh, projects that I've been involved in and, and have read about sort of thing. So the, the first one is really, it's, project, it's weak project management processes and soft skills. And uh, part of that is that everybody thinks that uh, project management is easy and, um, and it can be done. And also that it's a formula that can just be followed and it only has one end result. And they really miss the soft skills part of it. And as Mel has said, it's the communication side that uh, if we don't communicate, doesn't matter how much technology or how much of the uh, body of knowledge that you use. And there's a huge body of knowledge in project management, uh, it can still go off the rails. Uh, one of the things that we do find now and especially uh, recently is that projects uh, are becoming larger and more complex. And what happens there is that you get large project teams, which again, slows down the communication and it makes it for really fuzzy uh, leadership structure. Who's, who's actually 
uh, responsible for making the final decisions. Uh, there's lots of opinions. There's lots of uh, um, of other things. And again, uh, from my perspective, it's much better if you have a small a small team. I don't I don't believe in single authoritarian project management where there's one decider and it will get, get done the way he does or not. And uh, uh, having talked to some people about that have worked with uh, uh, with Musk, uh, that's his style is that it will be done his way regardless of what the team says or, or what they do. But I feel that if you get a team that's diverse between five and 12 people, that's very manageable and the communication is very uh, short and clear, but you still need sort of who's gonna take the leadership at different pieces and that sort of thing. Um, the, the other one that I'm seeing a lot more, and this is a myth, and this is that, and, and you see it in the, uh, uh, you see it from the government, you see it from the, uh, um, and, uh, the uh, media in that all stakeholders must be satisfied, regardless of whether it's fact or opinion, whether it's a pet project that must be done. Uh, it takes the, it just leads to really vague outcomes and out uh, and set up. So, so what you need, to, what the team needs to be able to do is listen to everybody, but ultimately match it to the uh, the outcome that was expected, you know, or as my uh, as my old boss used to say, you have to write a fucking check. How hard can it be? And we found out how difficult it can be with the Phoenix system to uh, to do that sort of thing. Um, and again, in large organizations, this is not just governments. Uh, there's an excessive cover your ass documentation. Uh, everything is documented just to make sure that uh, when the uh, audit comes afterwards, uh, at least your ass is covered in terms of moving it forward. It takes up a tremendous amount of, uh, of energy and it assumes that uh, there's a predetermined outcome. And that also comes now with multi-year timelines. And what happens with multi-year timelines is that you lose uh, momentum and knowledge because you just don't keep the team together for two, three, four years and nobody remembers what happened uh, two years ago or what decisions were made uh, to set up no matter how well you've covered your ass in the documentation. So uh, uh, I think Yogi suggested that uh, really uh, the timeline should be maximum one budget cycle or one year so that at least you have a timeline to look at. Are we still on the right direction? Are, are we sending uh, good money after bad? That sort of thing. And from my perspective, I think uh, multiple uh, uh, three or six month projects are much more efficient, but you do need, need a way to, uh, to bridge the silos and communicate between the projects, but it's better to break it up into small pieces and uh, set it up. And then the, the last one I got, and it's a bit more of a soft thing, is this idea that perfection gets in the way of, uh, of good. And uh, there's no project that's ever going to be uh, uh, perfect. Uh, no outcome will ever uh, satisfy everyone. There's no one size fits all solutions. There's no silver bullet solutions. I mean, silver bullets work better for werewolves and uh, uh, vampires and those type of things to, to get rid of it. And so what you need to be able to do, and that's where a smart or a small team uh, works better is the permission to fail. And by fail, I don't mean the whole thing goes goes off the rails, but there's going to be things that aren't, that are going to be, as the engineers call it, suboptimal and uh, need to need to be fixed and set up. And as Guy Kawasaki from uh, iPhones uh, uh, used to say, is that at some point you have to ship crap. Uh, you know, you'll never have the thing perfect, let your uh, users uh, uh, come up with the uh, weaknesses and fix it. And then you can bring in the Kaizen and the uh, iterative uh, or uh, incremental uh, improvement as you go through. But at some point you need to say, it's good enough, move on and uh, set that up. 
So like I said, by no means, a. Uh, am sure all of you could come up with a dozen more things that can go wrong on these things, but these seem to be sort of the overarching uh, things that have a, a tendency to go wrong in, uh, in a large uh, complex project. So Yogi, can I intervene here just for a minute? Maybe sure. Pick on a point Klaus, uh, Klaus has just made and, and one that was made early that clear goals or, or the lack of clarity on goal is often a, or a major problem. Um, I'd like a, a comment on uh, organizations reluctant to admit to mistakes. I mean, we're going to have failures at almost any time along the way in any project. No, no project, or very rarely, does any project go 100% well. So there have to be mistakes along the way. What? It seems to me that the, the reluctance of organizations to admit to mistakes may, may be a fundamental flaw in the organization itself. Any, any experience or comments you want to make about that? So, so I absolutely agree on that, that organizations seem to be much more rapid about assigning blame than recognizing success. So maybe our other panelists will jump in on that. And, and, and that's a huge impediment to successful projects. Yeah, and I think that that's again this thing about uh, weak project management processes and the idea that everything is perfect, and there needs the people that are doing it need to have the soft skills to communicate, and this is something that comes with experience and set up. And again, that fear, Perry, comes with the excessive cover your ass documentation, so you spend more time. Uh, trying to look like you're not failing than to actually solve the problem that has gone off the rails. So as is often cited, a mistake is really got value in providing an opportunity for learning. And if a mistake is made numerous times over and again, one begins to wonder whether that organization even has a culture of learning. So one of the things that it seems to me you're articulating is creating a culture of continuous learning does mean uh, acknowledging that they're going to mistakes, but we must admit to them if we're going to if we're going to learn from them. Okay. Yeah. So it's okay. So organizations that are attempting to address this problem often use the phrase fail fast, which means, to me, it means if you recognize a problem, you understand that and then redirect, reposition, re-aim your project to respond to that failure rather than spend a whole lot of time trying to uh, identify a scapegoat. Yeah, that and just I would add to that, it's fail fast, but also fail cheaply. Early on in the project, when you are setting out the uh, the outcomes and that sort of thing, it's a lot easier to make uh, changes. Uh, in a, When you're doing the design and you're doing drawings uh, for a large building, it's pretty cheap to, uh, move, to erase some lines and to move some stuff over and set it up before it becomes a big issue. Once you're into the construction process, now making the same change will require jackhammers and um, and new things, uh, new tools yeah. and, and new stuff that will all cost a lot more money than early. So the earlier on in the process that you can get a clear uh, idea of where you're going, the more ability that you have to explore multiple solutions and uh, before you, you commit to them. Thank you. Thank you, Klaus. That, that speaks to this curve. Uh, there's there's a curve, an exponential curve that describes what class is talking about, the cost of fixing a mistake by phase of the project. Sorry, Mel, you wanted to jump in well, there? I was just going to say that uh, there's two things, uh, two points. One is the typical type of a project. Some are very obvious to know that this as built will not work. And others are very subtle that, yeah, we got a new system, it's all working. And then behind the scenes, you find people doing workarounds to actually make it work for them. And what that does, it plays back to the project team in dissatisfaction, we'll never have you guys again, and that type of thing. So it's, it's kind of a, it's not sort of a one thing that it, this project has failed or whatever. But I think as Klaus said, that if you, as you go into it, it's always easier to fix things before you actually make them. To, to make to make sure everybody understands what's going on and make those changes early because when you really get in there into the project you've really got to stop some parts of it and you impact other parts of the project that have to go in parallel so you know it's, it is a situation where um, looking ahead 
uh, making the corrections, communicating all these things, and mitigating issues all the way is mandatory. Okay, thank you. Let's uh, move on and talk about the value that project management software can bring to improving project performance. So with that, Dragon, take it away, please. So when, um, uh, like a lot of small businesses, we encountered uh, everything that the panel is talking about. And so when we looked at tackling the, uh, the improvement of performance, well, we saw that there wasn't a lack of uh, wisdom or knowledge uh, for, or even defining some of the problems. What we found was a, a practical implementation of uh, whether it's software or methodology to help improve some of these. And so, um, uh, so what we found was that there was a lot of just knowledge, but the way that we, uh, the tools that we use to help us improve on performance really kind of missed the mark. So when we went to tackle this just for our team, uh, we kind of made a, a, a list, uh, a guiding principles on what, what we wanted to solve in uh, our software. And so one of the things that we found, and it kind of, uh, this one item addresses a lot of the challenges that we spoke about was, um, uh, and I think one of the most important one is to build instructions into the process. So first of all, you need a process to begin with. But what we saw was with the multitude of tools, the knowledge of how you do uh, what you're doing at that moment wasn't easily accessible. So, uh, and what that means is that, you know, we had a system that executed, you know, a, a project task, but how you did that task wasn't built into that process. And so what that means are people are having to search for it, uh, human nature takes over, we're lazy, we just don't do it. And then what, what happens there is uh, mistakes happen. So, uh, you know, uh, instructions need to be built into the process. The second thing that we found, and it kind of addresses a lot of the communications challenges, was uh, the, the communications need to uh, be contained within the project phase. And so right now what we see is there's emails, there's texts, there's calls, there's conversations. And those are not in context of uh, the work that we're doing. So whether um, uh, whether we need to come back and audit whether it was a mistake or how to improve it, you really have to look for that uh, chunk of information. So uh, the system, whatever that was, needed to have all of the chats, all of the documents in, a, in an area or in a container that only addressed what we were doing at that time. So... Um, that was that was really important and it alleviates a lot of the communication errors. Uh, the other thing that we found that was important for especially for productivity was reveal the difference between duration and time effort. And so um, and th this is a really simple but kind of complex to get. And so um, uh, and a lot of systems don't do a good job of revealing that, it only took us like 150 hours to do this task, but it took three weeks to actually go from start to finish. Once you reveal the difference between those two numbers, and you can look at the conversations in and around that, we can actually begin to solve some of the problems about how to decrease or get that duration and time effort closer together. So that was a critical, that was a critical aspect of something that we wanted to achieve. Next was and this is more of a, um, a UX principle in developing software is to report as you navigate. And what that means is, um, and you know, we said, you know, one of the things that we said is if you have to go to a report screen, you're, you've lost in some ways. Uh, we needed to create an, uh, an interface that as you're navigating through it, it gave you some feedback, what's outstanding, how many projects are left, things of that nature. So as much as possible into, uh, into that experience of using the software so that you didn't have to do a report. And that actually made a really big difference to the decisions that you made on a moment to moment basis. The other thing that, that, that um, uh, so number five was to eliminate excuses with uh, clear accountability. And 
th this kind of loops into number one, where the instructions are built into the process. So if the instructions are built into the process, it leaves little wiggle room for the people who are actually doing the work to A, mess up in the first place. But if they did mess up, we knew that it was either bad instructions or they had messed up. So it kind of eliminates a lot of the, the, the challenges that people go through with, I didn't know, or I made a mistake. Um, uh, that, that's a really important uh, part. Uh, number six, uh, uh, what we found was ensure a rapid feedback loop. So when we looked at uh, both software and also uh, when we interviewed people, what we found was the people on the ground doing the work uh, who were in a lot of cases were solving the problems um, uh, and in, you know making improvements. It took a really long time for them to take that knowledge and push it back to the people who are actually creating the processes and the project management. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to make sure that uh, there was a, a very easy way for everyone who was working to do it like a, hey, I can suggest an improvement and the way for that improvement to become a part of the new process. So a rapid feedback loop is maybe the fastest way to improve overall efficiency over a long period of time. Uh, the the number seven is um, is one again. It's another design principle that what we found was uh, design a linear process and reduce the or eliminate the if thens. And so what we found was uh, for a lot of the the people who aren't you know who are more uh, blue collar uh, actually doing the work, they found what you know, project managers see on a regular basis overly complicated. So they needed something to follow that was easy and a linear process. And so in the in the cases where you did have an if then, so if the, you know, if the, the reading failed, then we needed to do something else. That's just another linear process. So wherever possible, do a linear process. Uh, number eight was provide clients with process visibility. So when you're working with the project, you obviously want your team to have um, a, a bird's eye view of every phase of the project and where you're at. Uh, but what's missing in a lot of systems is the client's visibility into the process. So uh, what ends up happening is they're out of the loop, they interrupt the, the project, um, it, uh, um, yeah, it, it causes a lot of cascading issues when the client is not in the loop. When the client is in the loop, you can make better decisions both internally and externally so that when you do have a, uh, when you have an issue, it's easy for the customer to kind of see what that process is. And then finally uh, was to architect the balance between simplicity and complexity. When we looked at uh, both simple and enterprise tools, what we found was, you know, they were too simple, they didn't do enough or they were too complex that nobody really wanted to use them. And so you had, uh, you had, um, uh, you know, the, it's common, you know, the saying is like, you're only using 10% of the tool because it's just too complex. So we needed to strike a balance between that, something that was really easy to use, but could do the, the big things really, really well. So if you could go to the next slide, uh, Yogi. So uh, the the uh, so the the um, the tool that we created we're we're calling steps, and the uh, the core component of this step is the ability to create a process template, and this is what the practical implementation of some of those principles. And so what we're looking at here is um, a step by step process where each step you can uh, add tasks instructions, documents, videos, and uh, you can add time for that particular step. So everything that my team needs to know is embedded into that step. So if somebody needed to, to, uh, to uh, you know, didn't know something, they had really easy access to it. When there's an improvement, I only go to one place to make those changes, which again, propagate to my entire team. Um, uh, if you take a close look there, we have open AI. And so now you can say, hey, chat GPT, create me a, a, a process for, 
uh, everything. So, uh, you know, as long as chat GPT can find it, it can create you a process. We've been playing with this and we're very happy with uh, the results. It's, it's not perfect, but it's, it's pretty good. Uh, the other thing that kind of addresses the, the whole project management process in a macro sense was once you create this, we're developing what we call a library where you can save your processes into the library where uh, similar to the Google or uh, uh, the Google or uh, Apple uh, App Store, other people can download that process. Um, so we're not having to reinvent the wheel over and over. Uh, we have, uh, yeah, and so that uh, I'm pretty excited about that. So an app store for processes that it, you, you can uh, share globally, either for free or you can sell. Uh, if you could go to the next slide. So this is, this is an example of a client with three projects. And so when you're looking at this screen, we see the customer's information on the left-hand side. And then we have three projects. One is a, a, a Google local service ad implementation. One is a sales process. One is a website upgrade, but really this could be anything. So if imagine if this was a, a construction project, you could have uh, you know, foundation, framing, electrical, and each of these has its own process. Now, each one of the squares you can click into, and that's where the conversations all happen, and they're they're connected to that one step. So all of the decisions, all of the the uh, all of the the conversations are in context of that step. So at a glance, somebody can take a look at this and see exactly where that overall project is. Green is done, blue is in process, little uh, red. Uh, red tri uh, triangle is is um, something's wrong, and then we can kind of uh, drill into it for more information. And uh, the next step, or the next slide, Yogi. Okay, uh, Th yeah, thank you. That, that was it. Thank you for Dragon for that description of what project management software features should be there so that this software can support and improve uh, project management of the project and contribute to its success. So Yogi, again, I'd like to ask Dragon. Uh, Dragon, uh, your, your, your tool, is, is there any particular industry or size of organization or, or that you're targeting? Uh, or is this, I do baking, uh, but people build things like Eiffel Towers. Is there a particular target that you have in mind for your company? Well, our, our positioning statement is everything is a process. And so uh, our uh, early adopters are probably going to be in the, the small business uh, community. However, uh, we can see uh, the tool being used by larger uh, enterprises to manage either uh, the overall project or parts of a project. And so the advantage that we have is that it's uh, it's much faster and lighter to deploy than traditional project management tools. To go in and create a process uh, is is much lighter. Our our um, uh, the other community that we want to go after is the experts, the project management experts. And so what we're hoping for them is to uh, document their wisdom and uh, publish it into the library either for free or as a paid download. Uh, and what we're hoping that uh, experts in every industry are populating the, uh, the, the, the marketplace or the library with, uh, with mature processes so that if you're a small business and you're starting, you can download very quickly your HR processes, your sales processes. Um, you know, we, we envision banks, right? So if you're a tire shop, uh, head office can create mature processes that uh, you can quickly deploy and a company can can uh, execute very quickly. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that question, Perry, and a good answer from Dragon. So let's talk about how you actually improve project management. I've split this into what individuals can do for themselves and what organizations should be thinking about as they uh, you know, green light or approve various types of projects. So individuals 
should avoid becoming the accidental project manager. As has been stated before, project managers are not people who fell out of bed one day and decide they're a project manager, even though sometimes in organizations that happens. So they sh you should also define your career path. And this gets to the issue of program managers, project managers, and team leaders. And I probably say, said it in the reverse order of the way someone's career is most likely to develop. Uh, certifications are useful. They're evidence of thought and evidence of commitment to the profession. And you need continuous professional development. Now, the list of what organizations can do is a bit longer. And it starts with reducing ad hocacy or chaos. That will help you with success. If you value project sponsors, sorry, project organization and planning, you recognize there's value in project management and you use a standard methodology for your projects so that every project doesn't start at the beginning. It builds on the best practices that have been identified by the projects that came before them. And the idea of deliverable templates reinforces that. PMO stands for Project Management Office. If your organization has multiple continuing projects, this PMO concept has is an invaluable for providing mentorship and support for your projects and monitoring the pro progress of every project and frankly, making sure that a hand goes up when there's a problem that it's nipped at the bud. Uh, we've talked about failing fast, so recognize if a project is failing and if you can't, uh, solve it, cancel it, and start over. Did you and, know, Yogi, I want to interrupt. Uh, something just came to mind, which was exceptional. When Toyota first came to market, the first release they, of their automobiles, they had a an error, a major error. It was a major error, but it was, it was minor in terms of the operation of the vehicle. What they did is they put, they, they notified, not a callback, but they notified all of their uh, their Toyota buyers that there was a mistake. So they acknowledged and and acknowledged that mistake. Uh, called them in and on on the on the uh, recall, they got a, a rose and a box of chocolate on the front seat of the car. Do you know that that mistake was intentional in order for them to demonstrate their maintenance commitment? I I, I haven't heard that story, so yeah. thank you for sharing it. Yeah. But there's another Toyota story. Is they unloaded their first two Toyotas in 1947 in. Los Angeles. And the people who were with those two cars very quickly realized that these cars, since they were simply the Japanese cars, would be a disaster, would undermine the brand, and they would have no sales at all. And they quickly scuttled back to Japan. And it was an incredible learning moment for that organization and was one of the many factors that eventually led to the dominating success that we see today. So thank you for that story. Okay, conclusions. Superior project management is valuable. I don't think any, it, you know, there are still people who challenge it and think it's overhead, but I, I think they're getting, getting to be very few. The second is that opportunities exist for improvement. There are many organizations that, that look themselves in the eye very seriously and say, you know, that disaster suggests we need to think more about uh, project management and project management improvement. And the third one is that superior project management is not enough to ad address major project issues. You must define project reasonably and this, this reasonably counteracts the tendency to reward those who's, who make ambitious proposals and then disappear once the proposal is approved, expecting to be lauded and credited and promoted, but at a time before much money is spent, before anything can go wrong. So the recommendations uh, are just to develop these project management skills and gradually build expertise within your organization and then push back against what gets in the way, which is assigning blame. I guess you've heard this before, grandstanding, ducking accountability. Now, it's really easy to say these things in a presentation format like today at this webinar. 
it's a lot harder to actually implement the kind of culture that uh, that pushes back against these stunts and rewards people for doing their very best. And when you can build a culture that values the best practices for the entire project life cycle and not just part of it, that's when you'll get the major benefits from project management and project results. So that's our presentation today. You've heard from all of us. Is there anything that's stacked up in the chat, Perry, that you think we should uh, spend some time on? Or do any of our panelists have any closing comments they'd like to make? Let's do the closing comments first. Then I've got a couple of points that I'll draw on from the chat. OK, that uh, with no further comments from the panel, uh, I, I see you've put on a list here of how to contact you. Do they make do they contact you if they'd like to get copies of the slides? Uh, you can contact us, or if you want to post them somewhere, you can write down this email address, whoops, and you can contact me there, and I'm happy to send you the slides. Okay, excellent. Uh, there are a couple of points. Uh, if you can, if you can uh, uh, reduce the screen share, uh, Ken Bainey is with us. I, I know Ken, Bain, Ken very well, a project manager, and is certainly one of his fortes. Ken has made the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the point uh, that uh, red tape whether red tape is a lot of administrative overhead, complex processes, uh, uh, overbearing meetings. Uh, re have you alluded to, or do you want to reinforce or make any comments about the relevance of red tape, which seems to be just a bureaucratic imposition on, on projects? Any well, examples? Klaus, Klaus spoke about that. Do you want to elaborate on anything there, Klaus? Uh, not red tape specifically, but the... Uh excessive documentation of cover your ass stuff okay, okay. that uh, dragon now is automating for us okay well uh, okay uh, so there, there's a current excellent example of that extremeness as you may know in ontario the uh, rapid transit system is being expanded with multiple lines and many billions of dollars are being thrown at that and the auditor general that that office's action are to uh, or, or the result of the requests of the auditor general are for everyone to crank out this documentation that class is talking about. And it's literally adding billions of dollars to the sum of these projects. So that's the latest example of what class is talking about. That's a public sector project, is it not? Yep. So does the adding of billions of dollars make any difference to anybody? Seemingly Be not, <laughs> because nobody's pushing back against the Auditor General, which is probably a very career limiting move to push back against the Auditor General. I make that point tongue in cheek, but I, I think it's something taxpayers ought to become well aware of, of what the cost of, of of failure in project management is in public sector. Mm -hmm. And it would seem okay. to me to be an indication that maybe public sector as a manager has flaws in it, one of them being a reluctance of politicians to to fess up to making mistakes as if somehow um, th that level of failure will lead to them losing their power as opposed to Ralph Klein acknowledging mistakes and getting on with it. Okay, but I, okay, I'm, it's, um... I'm sensitive to those politicians because the other party will gleefully highlight these mistakes as incompetence, which is inappropriate, to in an effort to win the next election. Well, they may end up having to buy the project the way it goes. Okay, Ken. Okay. Uh, you okay. raised with me the point of AI yeah, yeah. and the role okay. of emerging technology. And anyhow, um, Yogi, um, tell me, what's your perspective of using um, gener generative AI, ChatGPT and other tools, to manage and deliver projects? I'll, I'll tell you right now, uh, I'm teaching at university, and I have teaching project management, and... Um, and you know what I do? I change the whole perspective of how people manage projects by using examples, by using good prompts in ChatGPT and providing scenarios. So the whole course was changed from theory to providing scenarios using ChatGPT. You're, so you're, you're, okay. you're one of the early investors, in, are you not, Ken? Pardon me? 
Um, one of the early investors in ChatGPT. Yeah, right? yeah, I know. Okay, that's that's <laughs> okay. that's okay. Um, there's a book coming out on it, not by my, um, soon. Um, oh. yet, 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 um, Chugi, the book is really on project management using artificial intelligence. Well, we're gonna yeah. we're gonna ask you we're gonna ask you to participate in a future yeah. webinar. Anyhow, um, Yogi, so tell me what you think. What is your perspective of using? Okay, so. Ken, good to see you. It's been a few years since we've talked, so mm -hmm. good to see you're smiling and doing great work. So your perspective on ChatGPT, I, I think this tool can help. I like what you said about scenarios. Mm -hmm. There are so many dimensions to project management. It's hard to uh, juggle them all for most project managers. So if in a university setting, you paint various scenarios for people to attack or case studies, one or the other. I think that's a great learning tool to, to pro build awareness in project managers on the kind of gotchas that can fly in from left field and derail the project or the project manager. And often people don't notice these things and then all of a sudden they're out on their ear, the project's canceled, sure. whatever. I noted. Oh, yes, uh, I know. I noted, by the way, as we get ready to wrap up uh, on the red tape point, that uh, the Alberta government does have a ministry of red tape. Uh, it's in service Alberta. Now I understand that that ministry is not there to create red tape, but is to get rid of red tape. So I just that wasn't clear in the title, but uh, so yeah. two things. I think the minister in charge of red tape is making progress. That's the positive. The not so positive, I think it's it's just barely scratching the surface of the opportunities that are there. Well, I'd like to I'd like to jump in there at some point and have a discussion on procurement and government or public sector. Oh procurement. yeah, that's another. And some work with uh, which the Alberta Council of Technologies did a few years ago, uh, and found that both administrators and contractors had a significant problem with the. Uh, uh, procurement processes that were in, incorporating social objectives into uh, engineering projects. But I'll, I'll leave that aside for a, for going forward. So I'm going to say thank you, Yogi. Uh, thank you, Klaus. Thank you, thank you Dragon. Uh, thank you, Melith. This was superb. And, and Ken for your input and others for their questions along the way.